Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 9. Here we're looking at attitudes and attitude changes. So this is something that we're all familiar with. We all have an attitude and I guess we all would like to change it sometimes. Okay, so here are our learning objectives today. What are attitudes and how are they learnt as well as their nature and characteristics? So we'll look at that an attitude consists of a series of parts. Um, uh, a part thinking, part emotion, part action. And of course, because of that, there are various ways we can change attitudes. Composition and scope are some various models of understanding attitudes or theories. How our experience leads to the initial formation of, of attitudes. The various ways in consumers' attitudes are changed or can be influenced. And how consumers' attitudes can lead to behaviour. And how sometimes behaviour itself can lead to attitudes. And that's simply because we like to keep our attitudes and our behaviours to be consistent. So what's an attitude? Well, there are a number of definitions in your text. Here's one that's quite nice. A learned predisposition to behave in a consistently favourable or unfavourable way with respect to a given object. And that's really shown later in, I think it's uh, figure 9.5 in your text, which talks about attitude at activation. It's one of the uh, theories of attitudes. And you can see here that the, the theory works from the selective perception, our perceptions towards the objects, the way we classify that event, which then leads to a behaviour. So in other words, it's a learned predisposition. predisposition. We're not born with an attitude, we develop them over time. Here are some uh, important aspects of attitudes which are shown on this slide. When we talk about an atti attitudes, it's, it's towards something. In marketing, this could be products, brands, services, retailers. It could be individuals, countries, and so on. Attitudes are not something that we're born with. Uh, they're learnt over time. So they're learnt from direct experience, from other people telling us things, word of mouth, uh, advertising influences attitudes, as does uh, your time online and other direct marketing. As I said earlier, attitudes are relatively consistent with the behaviour they reflect. Now that makes it tricky because sometimes our behaviour can change, therefore we can move back and change attitudes. And this is really occurs, which we looked at a few weeks ago, with uh, classical conditioning and instrumental condition, conditioning. Attitudes also occur within a situation. So certain situations uh, change, for example, our feelings, and that of course can change our attitudes. So it can also be, may mean that a situation can sometimes make us behave inconsistently with our attitudes and this might have to do with uh, different uh, social norm pressures or different events and the way we determine those events. How attitudes are learned? Well basically we start with no attitude to at least some attitude towards the object and this is the result of learning. So you can see the importance of learning in memory that we talked about earlier. So you might learn a, a favourable attitude to a brand by instrumental or operant conditioning. Or you might have a brand name as an unconditional stimulus, positive reinforcement, which results in a brand attitude. A new product linked to an established brand would be a conditioned stimulus through a process of stimulus generalisation. So again, you can see the importance of learning here. Some attitudes follow a trial of a product, which we would call instrumental conditioning. So one way of changing consumers' attitudes is to reward their behaviour or to encourage them to try on a product. Or consumers can form attitudes based on their own thinking and knowledge and beliefs and we call this cognition. Now personality also plays an important role in attitude formation. For example, um, you need to go back and look at the lectures, but obviously people who have a high need for cognition will have a positive attitudes to promotions that are rich in product related information. People with a low need for cognition who don't really want to think about uh, information too much um, will have a positive attitude towards promotions based on attractive models or well known celebrities. And this is, of course uh, leads us into this idea of the elabor elaboration likelihood model which we'll discuss earlier about people who are highly involved and less involved in uh, issues and products and services. Now, one way of thinking about attitudes is what we call the tri-component model. And it's called tri because there's three bits. And as you can see in this diagram here, the three work together 
in terms of formation of attitudes. Affect has to do with emotions and liking and preference. Cognition is thinking and judgment. And connotation is um, wanting to act in a particular way. And you can see that it's a circle, that these things all feed off each other. So for example, if my uh, Sony Walkman, my sorry, my 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 change my age there. If my Sony television works well, I get a positive feeling towards that, and that also drives my behaviour towards that brand. Here's just a further explanation of what I've just talked about. So cognitive is often what we call thinking, knowledge, and perceptions, usually acquired importantly by direct experience plus advertising. The affect is the, is the consumer's emotions or feelings about a particular product, or particular product or brand, not to be underestimated. The connotative component is the likelihood that a consumer will behave in a certain way. Now, remember that one of the things we'll look at today is that attitudes don't really predict behaviour, but they predict an intention to behave in a particular way, because many things influence behaviour. Here's an example of beliefs. The expectations that uh, this also forms part of attitudes, so attitudes are collections of beliefs. And so this is for uh, Bagon, and you can see the belief here is that this is a very powerful brand. You can form a larger brand belief, and here we formed a, a brand belief about uh, Nescafe Gold Blend uh, and its uh, newer rich aroma. Affect is feeling and it's the feelings towards an object or the emotion that object involves for a person. And this can be a very powerful source of attitudes and this is shown by this advertisement here by, by showing uh, uh, the, the relationship of the, of the watch to the feelings and emotions of someone's, uh, and the way they view themselves as a consumer. Connotation's a bit more harder to sort of show in an advertisement, but here is an example of how it's often measured by what we call intention to buy scales. Okay, so we've got three components of an attitude. How then do they influence choices that we make or evaluations? Here we're looking at the attitude of how we might evaluate two objects, um, buying a DHL for which are provide businesses small package delivery or shopping for an airline on the internet. There are our beliefs. Now beliefs of course can be somewhat correct or incorrect, but they are consumers' beliefs. There are our affect and feelings and there are our connotations or actions. And you can see these three things tend to be consistent. Now there are a number of multi-attribute models because an attitude consists of more than one thing. So if we go back previously, you'll see that the attitude towards uh, DHL consisted of its reliability, how economical it was, its customization. Uh, the feelings was that it, oh, a sense of security, that it met needs, or whether they actually um, identified with that company. And so there's more than one set of things going on here in forming the overall attitude towards that brand. So we call this the attitude towards the object model. And it's a sort of summative uh, score or attitude. Then we've got what we call the attitude towards behavior, which is really saying, okay, I can have a positive attitude towards a Ferrari, but what's my attitude to actually selling everything I own and buying a Ferrari? Ferrari? And that's really the attitude towards the behavior model. The theory of reason action model goes a bit further and it talks about um, other factors that influence the actual choices. And that, this is where we start to look at things like perceived control, which is really also explained by the theory of planned behavior. Here's an example of um, how we might do with the first one, or how we might evaluate an attitude towards an object. And here we have two providers, AAPT, which is an old internet provider, and Telstra. And I've just made this data up. And you can see here that uh, these are also how we would, would collect information. And you can see the evaluation of the attribute or belief is shown here. So this is really belief strength along here. And the evaluation of the consequences, which is a, whether this is a negative or positive thing. Often confused with importance, but shouldn't necessarily be because the connection, obviously it's highly important for number three that the connection will be dropped out in the middle of session, but it's, there's a negative consequence there. And we form attitudes by, um, 
really multiplying the evaluation of the consequences times the strength of the belief. A more wider theory is what we might call the theory of recent action, which starts to talk about the attitude towards the behaviour rather than the object. And uh, this was developed, as you can see down the bottom there, from Martin Fishbein and Itzhak Azim. And basically, there's two, there's two major parts to this model. Firstly, there's the belief that the behaviour leads to certain outcomes, the evaluation of those outcomes. So now we're dealing with attitude towards the behaviour, not the object. And then we have what we call subjective norms, beliefs that, uh, uh, should, that should or should not perform that behaviour or the motiva motivation to comply with specific uh, reference or other groups. And we call these social norms. So this kind of model works quite well for highly socially visible uh, decisions we might make, very important decisions we might make, where we value the opinions of other people. Here's an example of working out what we might uh, call the um, of attitude towards the behaviour. And, and often some of us may decide to go on a trip after we finish our, our uh, study. And so we might uh, firstly consider the beliefs about taking a trip to England versus Japan and the consequences of taking those uh, trips as well. And you can see here firstly there, that there are positives and different scores given to uh, going to England or Japan and then there is a what we might call the evaluation of those consequences here which can be negative. So you can see being expensive down here is negative. So Japan is rated more poorly than going to England in terms of expense. And the attitude towards whether we pick one or another is just summing up these two scores times this row here to give you an overall score. And the idea is that this would really form our attitude towards uh, the behaviour. The higher the score, the more likely we are to go to England versus Japan, which would seem to be the case there. However, when we add in uh, social norms, such as the normative strength, so how important your brother is, uh, whether that influences England or the Japan trip, your special friend or your boss, it changes the score quite a bit. And as you can see here, the boss is quite, there's a, quite a strong motivation to comply and influence here. Your special friend has an influence, but it's sort of negative for this Japan trip. And so that the England trip then goes up by one, but the Japan trip is interestingly gone up by 11. So if we've gone up, if we go back there, what the subjective norms here have changed the way we might have made the decision individually. So you can see why this is a nice theory of attitude, because it includes both internal thinking and dynamics versus the impact of other people. So that's the, the theory of planned behaviour, but another way we can add to is, is, is say, okay, what is our capability or t autonomy and how does that affect our behavioural intention and actual behaviour? We may not end up going to um, England simply because we couldn't afford the money or the trip. Also, the degree of autonomy. Maybe we, we couldn't get away from our partners. Maybe we feel we couldn't be in a position to make that decision given that we're very busy at work. And so these other factors that what we call the perceived behavioural control are also going to influence intention, which hopefully will influence actual behaviour. Okay, so there's some theories. How are these then useful for changing attitudes? Firstly, the theory of planned plan behaviour can be used to change attitudes in the following ways. The first one is to change the consequences of behaviour, whether they're negative or positive. So speeding, you're in our sights, so clearly what the New South Wales uh, road safety uh, campaign is trying to do here is to change a consequence of behaviour, change the perceived likelihood, so that uh, we could do this by double demerit points. Um, Hume talks about in his chapter, in Queensland about a road safety ad where somebody loses their job because they've lost their licence, so we're adding another consequence to the behaviour. So the first one that we approach we might do is to look at what are the outcomes of the behaviour, which is really the top part of the model. We can also change subjective norms, and here we can add a significant reference group, so we might have an admired group or a spokesperson, we might change the perceived beliefs of a reference group, or we might change the motivation to comply with a reference group. 
A good example here is the New South Wales Road Safety Campaign, Get Your Hands Off It, which is about not using mobile phone cars. And you can see all these three things are shown in this advertisement. I've been walking down the road for several days now Thinking about my love that's gone away They say let go but I don't seem to know how Cause I just need to Instagram this latte Get your hand off it Get your hand off it Get your hand off it It's hard to understand what the big deal is Everybody's done it more than once And it's just so easy to express my feelings When I'm texting smiley face emoticons Get your hand off it Get your hand off it Get your hand can only tell a man the truth but maybe I can have a second chance in this song all I need to do is activate my Bluetooth get your hand off it get your hand off it get your hand off it eyes back on the road get your hand off it Get your hand off it Get your hand off that fancy mobile phone Okay, now of course there are more than one group uh, that this advertisement is uh, done for and uh, <laughs> and basically uh, you can see here that it's shown here that uh, that you can see that this is done for, there's a there's a group there is a version for um, for um, <laughs> there is a version for different types of uh, subgroups such as pop uh, uh, rock and uh, hip-hop and so on so this is really changing the, the significant reference groups changing the beliefs that this is a very smart way to behave and changing the motivation to comply uh, that this is a really silly thing to do. Now, how does this kind of advertising work? Well, interestingly, we like to have consistency with our attitudes, and uh, so what this advertisement, what this adver what this research diagram shows you here is that the feelings and attitudes towards the ad will link back to the to the brand or the object which are represented in the ad because we like to have consistent attitudes. So often, this is why advertising is such an important way of changing or influence attitude, attitudes towards um, brands. So we talk about the attitude towards the ad, influencing the attitude hopefully towards the brand. Now of course people can have conflicting attitudes about an object. Uh, so attitudes strategies sometimes they need to resolve these conflicting attitudes. If consumers can be made to see that the negative attitude towards the object is sometimes or its attributes are not really in conflict with other attitudes, they may change the evaluation from negative to positive. Palm oil of dishwashing liquid in the 1950s and 60s counted the very strong attitude that people had that dishwashing liquid was really bad on your hands. Although there was a conflicting attitude that dishwashing liquid is something good because it helps clean dishes. And as you can see in this advertisement, uh, from that time, this advertisement, which has run, which has really created this successful brand, uh, has resolved these two conflicting attitudes.
New hair color oh. called outrageous red. Mm, it's a perfect match for those hands. Oh. <laughs> it's dishwashing match. Try palm olive dishwashing liquid. Pretty green. Softens your hands while you do the dishes. You know you're soaking them. Dishwashing liquid, palm olive. Really mild or more than just mild. That's just don't quit. And it's up from pain. Match palm olive liquid's terrific. My dishes have never looked better. I didn't know they'd been sick. Take palm olive three times a day. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so you can see hands gentle on your hands while it does dishes is a very important way of resolving conflicting attitudes. Some other ways of, of the multi-attribute model are shown here. So we can change beliefs about the brands, we can add additional attributes. So for example, we can stress the reliability of safety, or we could say this breakfast cereal is good in reducing cholesterol. We could change the overall brand rating. This can sometimes be done, for example, with motor vehicles when they win win an award. Uh, we may also change the relative evaluations to, in other words, we might keep it cross over to another version of the product, a cheaper version or a more luxurious, luxurious version of the product. Here are some examples here. I won't go into all of them, but these are, these are for you to have a look at on um, YouTube. And this really shows some of the adver advertising examples here in changing attributes, sorry, attitudes according to the multi-attribute model. Also try and influence beliefs about competitors' brands or other choices. This is quite tricky. Uh, some examples here, Pepsi versus Coke in 1983. Um, whether it's a direct comparison or, or explicitly with a direct, an Apple Mac versus a personal computer, or by implying uh, or a, an implied comparison, the burgers are better at Hungry Jacks, also from the 1970s. Now, what's effective? It can backfire by giving visibility to the competitor's brand. And if the, if somebody is already brand loyal towards the brand that you're promote, that you're saying isn't very good, what we know from involvement theory is that just strength strengthens their beliefs. The elaboration the elaboration, the elaboration likelihood model is also another way that um, attitudes can be changed because we will then alter the way we might construct the message we're sending out to people. So the central route, if people are highly involved, is relevant because the consumer's motivation is high and they'll seek out information. So this is really driving the cognitive part of attitude change. In the peripheral route, we work actually more on the emotive part because there's a low involvement so people aren't going to actively search for information. Uh, there's a very nice uh, diagram, a nice example here on YouTube, which I've just pointed to here. If you click on this link once you've downloaded this lecture, which talks about some different attitude strategies which might be done by elaboration likelihood, and you can see the two different approaches as shown on this slide here. Now, complicating things is that behaviour can precede or follow attitude formation. And one of the major explanations here is what we call cognitive dissonance theory. And we, this is really where a consumer holds conflicting thoughts about the belief or attitude of an object. And what the consumer will do is try and, and confirm or find uh, information that uh, really confirms the wisdom of their choice. So this usually occurs when people have made a decision. Um, so you may have be feeling a bit of cognitive dissonance right at the moment because you've purchased a particularly expensive item, such as uh, university education, and they feel cognitive dissonance because they could have perhaps got a better choice. There's a nice example here, which is the Mazda uh, 3 ad, which deals with buyer's remorse. Now, dissonance is useful in a way for marketers because Consumers, when they make a major decision, are looking for wisdom of their decision. So reinforcement advertising, warranties, after-sales service, rationalisation, uh, simply telling consumers that they've got a good product, having other people tell them, or getting consumers to tell other people they've made a good choice, are all important ways that their behaviour can actually reinforce attitudes. Attribution theory is also an important form of attitudes because we may form attitudes according to what actually caused the behaviour, blame or credit of events. So people may blame or credit themselves, for example, the salesperson talked me into it, I shouldn't have decided to switch brands. So one's an external 
versus an internal. And as you can imagine, when consumers make good choices, they tend to say it's an internal attribution. When it's negative, they tend to say it's an external attribution. Here are some different perspectives on attribution theory here. And consumers will make judgments about their own behavior, which forms an important part of at attitudes. They'll form attributions towards others, uh, the motives, intentions of others, and they'll form towards things. This computer isn't very good, this car isn't very good, rather than perhaps the way I'm using this product or service. The foot in the door technique, which talks about the foot which talks about making a small request and then asking for the consumers to uh, perhaps make uh, a larger commitment. So that's often done with uh, lost leading or uh, a, a free trial bonus or a door in the face where, we are, where consumers may sign up for an expensive package but then can quickly uh, reduce that down to a smaller, more affordable package. And both these ways have been shown to be important in changing at, at attitudes. I put up an example of this uh, in Module 9, but here's the link to it here. So what are the implications of all this? Well, a consumer is going to form an attitude towards a company from its products and this will greatly influence the success or failure of a company's marketing strategy since intention and behaviour follows. Um, if a, it's also true that if I form a negative attitude towards a company, say Apple, that I may stop using their products but also urge friends and relatives to do likewise consume, because we learn attitudes by word of mouth and uh, as much as we do by direct experience. It's important to measure consumer attitudes, hence the discussion in the second part of the book about some of the various ways that we're doing. Not only that, but various components or parts of the marketing mix which are listed here. And this is often done through market research surveys and it's why uh, I guess marketing research is such a really important subject to do in your marketing program. When consumers have negative attitudes towards an aspect of the marketing mix, price or availability or warranties, then consumers, the marketers have to change those attitudes to make them favourable. So for example, for a long time, meat and livestock has advertised extensively to counter negative perceptions about the nutritional value of red meat, that it's actually quite important that it's healthy. Some other influences of how marketing strategy are shown here. So attitudes, of course, can be positive and negative, and they can range from very weak to very strong. And it's often easier to change indifferent or very weak attitudes than very strong attitudes. And attitudes have a resistance to change depending upon the confidence or, if you like, how important they are to people's own self-identity. So, as you can see in the bottom diagram, the marketing strategy influences feelings, beliefs and intentions, which influences attitude towards products, brands, the situations we might use or buy them, the people and places we encounter as part of that, which will then influence the attitude towards the behaviour. So to conclude, there's a lot more in the chapter, I guess, and I guess you need to read the chapter as well as listen to my dulcet tones. We looked at the definition of attitudes, and you can see it's a learned predisposition to behave in a certain way towards an object. We looked at some various models of attitudes, uh, attitudes towards the object, attitudes towards behaviour, which is called the theory of recent action, and also attitude uh, of planned behaviour, which includes um, our degree of control. We looked at how attitudes are formed. You're not born with an attitude, but they're formed from a number of uh, sources, including direct experience. And we looked at some of the strategies of how to change attitudes. Lastly, we looked at cognitive and distance and, and attribution theory, which is really how consumers themselves construct, uh, I guess, beliefs around them and how they then uh, will then, how then we can well influence or change those beliefs. I hope you really enjoyed this presentation as much as I enjoy teaching this course. Thank you.